All right, hi everybody. Uh, this lecture is going to cover geology, landforms, and the origin of geomaterials. Uh, the geology chapter two will actually divide, be divided among or between two lectures. Um, so this is just kind of an introduction to geology and why it's important for geotechnical engineering. So first of all, I'm not a geologist. <laughs> I'm not qualified to teach a geology class, um, but it's really important to understand some geology as a geotechnical engineer. So the goal of this lecture is really to kind of explain some of the background. Why is geology important? Geotechnical engineers work very frequently with geologists, so it's important to understand what you know, what your role is, and what the geologist's role is, and how you might work together. Um, so first of all, geology is the science of the earth. Uh, it's connected with history, form, composition, structure, and natural processes that happen on the earth. So, you know, this is the definition of it here. Certainly you could take a geology class as one of your um, general education requirements. And I think that that would be a great thing if you plan to be a geotechnical engineer. So geology is not equal to geotechnical engineering. These things are different. I am, a, well, I, I consider myself to be a geotechnical engineer. Um, I, I don't technically have a GE license, which is required to call yourself a geotechnical engineer. And we'll talk about licenses in a second as well. But I'm definitely not a geologist. So geology is a field of science. Geotechnical engineering is a field of engineering. Uh, we should know enough geology to kind of understand when we need to work with a geologist. Okay, a common problem might be landslides the way that um, rock formations were, were made. You know, a lot of landslides in Southern California happen in sedimentary rock formations. Understanding what's in all of those rocks, the way they were formed, that's really key to understanding how this landslide has happened and why it might continue or maybe will not continue in the future. Um, so we need to know enough to kind of know when we're in over our heads. And we have to be able to communicate with a geologist. And we use different words. Um, sometimes we use the same word to mean different things. Okay, the word consolidated or consolidation uh, means something very different to a geologist than what it means to a, a geotechnical engineer like me. Um, and, and we'll get to those definitions uh, later. All right, now there is um, professional licensure. This is an important topic for, for you to kind of understand. There's in, a geotechnical engineer will um, generally get a professional engineering license, a PE. Um, I have my PE, so I am a civil engineer. Um, you're technically not allowed to call yourself a civil engineer until you have a PE. It's a title act, so it's, it's illegal for somebody to call themselves a civil engineer and advertise themselves as such if they have not passed the PE. Uh, one thing I'll say is that the rules for the PE exam have recently changed. It used to be that you have to take, um, well, you, you can only take the exam after you have six years of qualifying experience, four of which can come from your bachelor's degree, one of which can come from a master's. So if you do a bachelor's and master's, you need one more year of qualifying experience working under the responsible care of a PE. Um, that's, it's no longer the case that you need to have that six years of experience to take the eight hour principles and practice exam. So uh, that, that's something that's changed and you should be aware of it. Now the only requirement is that you pass the FE and I think that you've completed your bachelor's degree. So you can take the eight hour exam um, pretty much right out of school these days. And then um, you're, you're not a PE until you get the qualifying experience. So you still have to put together your package and apply to be the PE, but you can't do that application until you've passed the eight hour exam now. In California, we have two extra exams to be a PE. There's the seismic and surveying specialty exams. You can't take those exams until you have your six years of qualifying experience. Um, okay, we also have a geotechnical engineer license, GE. Um, I don't have that. So technically, even though I've studied geotechnical engineering now for 25 years and have a PhD in geotechnical engineering, I'm not legally allowed to call myself a geotechnical engineer. <laughs> it seems a little bit counterintuitive, I know, but I don't have the GE license. So the GE, you need six years of qualifying experience um, beyond the PE, then you can take that exam and become a geotechnical engineer. 
Uh, if you're wondering, we also have an SE license for structural engineers similar to the GE. You can call yourself a structural engineer after you pass the SE. Okay, geology has some similar licenses uh, that we should be aware of. There's the PG, professional geologist, right? That would be kind of similar to the PE exam for uh, engineers. And then there's also CEG, certified engineering geologist. So an engineering geologist is fairly uh, closely tied with geotechnical engineers. Actually, some of my colleagues have their CEG and their GE, both. So it's possible to get both of these things and be a certified engineering geologist and a GE, all kind of under the same umbrella. Uh, okay, so let's move on now to geology subfields. So first there's petrology, that's the study of rocks. Mineralogy is study of minerals. We'll do a little bit of mineralogy here, looking at the structure of clay minerals, but not too much. Um, then there's structural geology, that's sort of the study of how landforms are um, structurally connected to each other, stacked on top of each other and so forth. Uh, geophysics, that's a field that is closely tied with geotechnical engineering as well. We're often working with geophysicists to quantify the stiffness of soil at a site, especially for seismic hazard evaluations. And then there's geochemistry, environmental geology, historical geology, paleontology, economic geology, geomorphology, hydrogeology, so many different things that you can study within geology. So, and then engineering geology is kind of a multidisciplinary field that involves both engineering in terms of some of the soil mechanics, de de strength and deformation properties of soils that we study, and the geology aspect. So how did those soils come to be? that has a big impact on their strength and stiffness. So all of this is kind of tied together. Uh, okay, engineering geologists obtain geological information that are required to describe features and processes, right? So how did the soil come to be? Is it alluvium? Was it deposited by a river? Is it aeolian? That would mean it's deposited by wind. That can have an impact on soil properties. They also look at the structure and characteristics of rocks and soil and interpret information for use by civil engineers. So uh, oftentimes geotechnical engineers are not really qualified to do the geological assessment, but we rely on it as a con to provide context for interpreting soil properties. Um, okay, and then geomorphology is a branch of geology concerned with the form or the shape of the Earth's crust. And it provides insight into what types of soil or rock are present and what problems might be anticipated at a site. Uh, geomorphology is also used to identify earthquake faults, right? So a, a trained geologist can look at an uh, aerial image and based on the geomorphology, oftentimes they can tell that there's been an earthquake fault rupture through that site, whereas normal people would look at it and not see those features. So it's pretty interesting stuff. Uh, okay, so then let's move on to this. All right, so here's a question. Now we're getting into the structure of the Earth. Um, so the Earth's crust is the, the solid part that we live on, right? So there's the crust, then beneath the crust is the mantle that's uh, molten. So that's what comes out of the Earth um, during a volcano. That magma that comes out is part of the mantle. So um, the mantle is viscous, right? It's molten rock that flows pretty slowly. So the question I have is that we're going to now compare apples and oranges, right? And also pomegranates and grapefruit. So if you look at the thickness of the crust and compare it to the diameter of the earth, it's, which fruit is more similar to that with respect to the diameter of, the, um, of the, the skin of the fruit or the rind relative to the fruit's diameter, right? Is it the orange, apple, right? Apple has a very thin peel. Um, pomegranate, a little, little bit thinner maybe than the orange, or similar to the orange, or grapefruit, which has a pretty thick rind, pretty thick peel. Well, it may surprise some of you to learn that it's like the apple, right? So the Earth's crust is actually very thin. The part that we live and walk on is like the peel of an apple. Actually, most apple peels are thicker relative to the size of the fruit of the apple than the crust is relative to the diameter of the earth. So uh, it's pretty interesting stuff. And then to make it even more interesting, the portion of the crust that geotechnical engineers tend to work with 
is only the very shallowest part of the crust, right? So the, the crust may be 10 kilometers thick. We're only interested oftentimes in the upper 10 to 30 meters or something like that for or maybe deeper for a bigger building. But, you know, we're dealing with really just like the dust that's on top of the apple, if you want to think of it that way. So here's a cross section of what the earth looks like. The crust is just this little kind of, it's hard to even see it. I'm going to try and trace it, right? That is the thickness of the crust. It really is pretty thin, and, and this may even be drawn too thick. Um, I'm not sure that this is totally to scale here. Um, then we have the, uh, the upper mantle here and the lower mantle, and then you get into, um, to, uh, well, there's a transition zone between them, and then you get into the outer core and inner core, which is really under a high pressure, very dense molten material. Um, the other thing I'll point out is that the atmosphere is also very thin, right? It's, it, we, I don't know, we, we live on the surface of the earth, the atmosphere just seems so big, we're walking around, you know, the sky is blue, it's way up there until you get out to outer space. But relative to the size of the earth, the atmosphere is very thin, just like a little blanket kind of wrapping the earth. Similar in thickness, actually, to the crust, maybe a little bit thicker than the crust. So I don't know if you can see here the crust, not very high resolution, but that says zero to 40 kilometers, right? So the crust thickness does vary as we move from place to place. Um, continental crust where there's high mountains, like the Himalaya mountain ranges, the crust tends to be pretty thick because those mountains have all been pushed up, um, whereas the, um, the oceanic crust can be fairly thin. Um, in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, there's even a rift where there's, there's very thin crust or almost no crust sometimes where a volcano happens, right? The crust is very thin. Um, okay, so I think I've already said this, geotechnical engineering involves almost entirely the study of the shallow crust. So um, we, we may look at deeper structures for seismic source characterization and for earthquake ground motion, sometimes we need to know basin structure. So that would be like how thick is a sedimentary basin. And that may come into play, but most of the time we're dealing with pretty much very shallow soils. All right, so let's talk about some different types of rocks. Um, you've probably learned this in your, um, in your uh, earth science courses, maybe in sixth or ninth grade. So you may already know this, but there are three kinds of rocks. There are igneous rocks, which form from molten mineral material and then they um, solidify and become rocks and they stay that way. So that igneous means that they haven't really changed, they, they were formed and now they're still like that. So these are volcanic rocks like basalt, pumice, tuff, breccia, plutonic rocks, granite, diorite, quartz, diorite. Um, okay, and then there are sedimentary rocks. Well, first I'll say that there are some pretty famous igneous rocks in California, right? There's Half Dome, El Capitan, big granite monoliths, pretty intact, strong rock. So uh, igneous rocks can be much stronger than concrete. Okay, and then there's sedimentary rock. And these are formed from accumulation and aggregation of existing rocks, right? So um, maybe igneous rocks will weather and break apart and then the, it forms soil, maybe gravel, cobble, sand, silt, clay. Those minerals are transported somewhere else due to landslides or flowing water or something like that, and they form soil. Then over many years, that soil gets compressed as more soil is accumulated on top of it. And under high pressure, sometimes high temperature, it will lithify and form sedimentary rock. So uh, these are precipitates, chert, limestone, dolomite, um, clastics like sandstone, shale, siltstone, claystone. Plastic just means formed from other bits and pieces. Um, there are also biological sediments. Um, there's coal, coral reef, um, chalk. There's also uh, peat or organic soil, right? This is like potting soil that you might buy at the, uh, at the garden center. And then finally there are metamorphic rocks and these result in from alterate, alterna alteration in the crystal structure due to chemical processes, heat, pressure, and so forth. Um, and either igneous or sedimentary rocks can metamorphize. So you can get metamorphic sedimentary or metamorphic igneous rocks. 
And then uh, foliated rocks are ones that have um, bands or laminates due to flattening of the mineral grains at high temperature and pressure. So foliated rocks include schist, phyllite, slate, serpentinite. You may have seen serpentinite driving around. A lot of times when there's a roadway cut, you'll see these kind of green rocks, like a vein of green moving up. That's serpentinite. It's pretty weak. It can be a problematic rock to make um, cuts in and do things in, 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 from an engineering perspective. And then non-foliated include quartzite, marble, hornfels, amphibolite, and so forth. All right, and then soil is formed from weathering a rock, either in place. So if you have rock, it degrades due to chemical processes, biological processes sometimes, and it forms soil right on top or in place where the rock was. It just kind of turns into soil and stays there. That's a residual soil. Um, or it can be transported, right? A lot of uh, soils are transported due to landsliding, any kind of mass wasting, erosion, um, so like the L.A. Basin, right, all of those sediments were transported here from other places. And the, the types of soil that we have are boulders, so that's the biggest kind of, we, we technically we call it soil, I don't, I don't know how many people would actually think of a boulder as being soil, but that is in the range of what we often deal with. Then there are cobbles. Um, we won't deal with boulders and cobbles too much in this class, right? So what we'll restrict ourselves to mostly are gravels, sands, silts, and clays. So we, in this class, we really only have to worry about four different types of soil. And the, the type of soil depends on the properties of the rock. So whatever the soil is made of has to have been abundant in the rock, and it has to persist, right? It can't break down further into other things. So in order to have gravel, right, it can't be made up of like clods of clay that would just dissolve and become clay over time. It has to be made up of something that will stay as gravel and persist over time. All right, I think I will end there for this lecture.